All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Blair Budd. I'm the director of the One Health Academy. Great to see so many attendees online. And thanks for joining us remotely once again. Uh, I have a few announcements before we get started as we let a few more folks join us. Uh, I wanted to say a special thanks and just a reminder that the One Health Commission um, is the one who supports our ability to join you this evening from the comfort of your own home. So thank you to the One Health Commission for sponsoring us for this webinar platform and also for American Society of Microbiology, which normally hosts us in person when that's safe. So thanks to both our sponsors for the One Health Academy. And um, wanted to welcome those that are new. I know if you were here in person, we'd pass around the mic and introduce everyone. So thanks you guys for being flexible with adjusting to this new platform. Um, if you have questions during the talk, I wanted um, to just note there's two features in the GoToWebinar platform, the questions and the chat. So please list your questions as we go through the presentation um, in the question section. So that's what I'll be monitoring for the speaker um, and it helps identify who's asking what while the chat section, you feel, feel free to utilize um, to interact with other attendees um, during, during the call. But for questions, please place that in the question section. Um, and I imagine if you're having audio issues, you won't be able to hear this, but I've put the, if at any point you lose audio connection, I've put the call in number for folks in the chat box and um, all attendees will be in listen only mode. So if you have questions this evening, please add them to the question section. And Dr. Griffin has been kind enough to agree to answer those that he can't get to this night via email. So that'll allow us to send him your questions if we run out of time. So that's all the logistics for tonight. Um, we have a really awesome speaker, so I'm excited to introduce him to you all. Um, Dr. Dale Griffin received a BS in microbiology in 1990 from the Department of Biology, University of South Florida. Um, in December of 1994, he received a Master's of Science in Public Health with a research focus on methods development for the detection of two pathogenic protozoa and environmental samples from the College of Public Health, USF as well. In December of 1999, he received a doctorate of philosophy with research focus on the use of molecular methods for detection of water quality indicator microorganisms and pathogenic viruses in fresh and marine waters from the Department of Marine Sciences, USF, in St. Petersburg, Florida as well. So he was recently awarded master's certificate in Six Sigma, Six Sigma Lean Enterprise Solutions and organization leadership from Villanova University and has authored or co-authored 84 peer-reviewed journal articles, 12 book, select, sex, woo, 12 book sections, and 66 other publications on issues of aquatic soil, um, aquatic soil and atmospheric microbiology. So now he will, um, he's joined us tonight. Um, so thank you so much for coming, Dr. Dale, um, Dr. Dale um, to present One Health, the Dispersion of Microorganisms by Global Scale Dust Storms. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dale Griffin. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me. I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. So I'm gonna be talking about something that I've been working on since I was hired by the USGS in 2000. And uh, this image I have up here is a great image of a dust storm over North Africa, taken from the uh, International Space Station. It's pretty graphic, huge storm covering the, uh, as far as you can see. So again, I work for the USGS. Um, pictured here is uh, Eugene Shin. Everybody calls him Gene. Uh, he has a great book, if you ever want a neat read on a, a life in sciences. And it's called The Bootstrap Geologist. And, uh, and Gene was a senior geologist at the USGS when I was a grad student under Joan Rose at, at the College of Marine Sciences in St. Petersburg. He was on my PhD committee. He used to, my qualifiers, he would kind of uh, terrify me because he would walk in uh, with a box of rocks usually. So as a microbiologist, that was always a challenge. <laughs> but uh, Gene, um, he had a 42-foot uh, Katie Krogan trawler, and he used to travel all through the Bahamas and the Florida Keys and out in the Tortugas. And he did a, a lot of his studies were in coral reef uh, environments. And... Uh, you know, one of the uh, things about coral diseases, uh, coral reef diseases, is that most 
of the literature attributed the outbreaks and so forth and stress to anthropogenic activity. So it was uh, building along the coastlines, and, you know, causing surface surface water runoffs, uh, wastewater, and so forth. But what Gene noticed, in, even in remote locations in the Bahamas where there were no humans or populations of significant numbers at all, and very little around, that there were still these um, disease outbreaks occurring. So he was looking for that common denominator, and he started, he came up with the idea that these big dust storms that were blowing over from Africa into the Caribbean each year were serving as a vector for pathogenic microorganisms that could be infecting uh, uh, coral reef organisms. So he had a friend in, um, who he went to college with at University of Miami, Nancy Maynard, who was working with NASA at the time. And uh, so he was pushing the idea with her and uh, she was, uh, it was the NASA Global Health Program, I think, is what she was running at the time. And she had done some work off the west coast of Africa, looking at diatoms and sediments and stuff like that, and, you know, addressing the potential windborne transport of uh, freshwater organisms to the marine environment. So she was interested in it. About the time I was ready to graduate, and, or was graduating and starting my first postdoc, and uh, so she um, funded Gene to... Um, analyze these samples, collect samples and analyze them to see if anything was alive in them. So we needed a microbiologist and there I was about six to nine months into my first postdoc and uh, he ended up hiring me. So that's Gene and that's how I got started with the United States Geological Survey. So this is a, a great animation. Uh, this past summer we just had a big storm event. I'm sure many of you heard about a big dust event that hit Texas and Louisiana and Florida and the really penetrated up into the middle of the country. Uh, this is an event that occurred, uh, was in the press in uh, August of uh, 2018, so several years back. So these large dust events occur on a regular basis. And uh, if you look in the literature, there's a number of papers that have attributed some of these deposition events in the Gulf of Mexico uh, with outbreaks of red tide. And uh, that's uh, could cause huge problems with floors, tur tourist industry, fishing industry, and so forth. So it's uh, it's always in the news. And uh, a little bit of trivia, the Gulf of Mexico receives about 4 million tons, metric tons of African dust uh, each year. And that's an average. So quite a bit of dust uh, moves around. And uh, a number of different uh, issues not only do we have uh, problems with like red tide that affect uh, can affect human populations but definitely can be devastating to populations of marine fish and and uh, other marine organisms uh, african dust or asian dust events uh, have been shown uh, to harbor uh, influenza viruses and this was a paper that was published by some taiwanese scientists that were able to demonstrate that during asian dust events coming out of china out of the Gobi and Takamaha deserts and were impacting their air quality in Taiwan, uh, they were uh, able to detect influenza viruses at a greater prevalence than they were during periods when there was no dust present. So that was definitely a, a human health focused uh, study and uh, pretty interesting. So these are the main pathways of uh, dust around the planet. Um, Sahara, most of the dust comes out of the Sahara. It's about 56% of the dust that moves around the globe uh, originates in the Sahara and Sahel regions of uh, North Africa. And if you look between the Americas and uh, Africa, the, the wind pattern over the North uh, Atlantic is cyclic and it's clockwise. And so that creates what we what are known as the trade winds because uh, it's continuous. And so when dust rolls, all these dust storms um, roll off the west coast of Africa, they get picked up by the trade winds and transported to the Americas. And in the winter, they go down into South America, and in the summer, they go up into um, uh, the northern Caribbean and um, in the southeast United States, typically. And uh, the uh, next largest uh, source is the, the Asian um, deserts of Gobi and Takamaha, and they're a relatively short period. This, um, their dust season is usually like April, April, May, June. And, uh, but what they, 
they can do typically is circumnavigate the globe. So, and they've been incurring in a greater frequency over the years. So in the United States, we get in the summertime, um, we get dust from Africa coming in from the uh, east. And then from the west, we have Asian dust uh, coming in. And, and the uh, amount of Asian dust that comes into North America has been shown to be about uh, 60 million um, tons per year. So quite a bit of dust. And these are just the hot spots and quantities of uh, a dust. And these are, this lists Africa at 1,087 uh, kilograms. And if you convert that to tons, that's uh, a billion. So a billion metric tons. But if you look in the literature, um, depending on the, on the paper, uh, the range goes anywhere from a billion to 5 billion tons per year. So certain years, um, can certainly like we had this past summer, um, you have a heavier dust transport. But this identifies with the size of the circle that North Africa is the primary source of dust to Earth's atmosphere. And uh, in Asian uh, dust uh, is the next biggest. And even within the United States over here in the Southwest United States, um, we have about 2 million metric tons that gets mobilized each year. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, there was a big, we had a big problem during the Dust Bowl years with dust storms in, uh, in the Americas. And that actually spurred the uh, Soil Conservation Act in the 1930s. It was a dust storm that impacted uh, Washington, D.C. from the American Southwest. So one common trend with dust storms is if you look at um, the primary source regions, they're usually dried lake beds. So this is Lake Chad. It shows on the left image, panel A is uh, an image taken in uh, 1963, and it was about 25,000 square kilometers. And uh, due to the anthropogenic activity, and it was mainly diversion of source waters for agricultural purposes, the size of the, the lake has been reduced to about 1,350 square kilometers. So this region around Lake Chad is a uh, primary source. The reason is, is lakes and the waters can work the sediments into very fine powder. And so when they dry out, they're easily mobilized by uh, wind events and storms. And uh, in America, uh, Lake Owens, which was tapped for a drinking water source in the early 20th century and was quickly uh, dried out, is still uh, uh, just a fraction of the size of its former cell. And it's the primary source of uh, dust to uh, the atmosphere in North America. So dried lake beds and the Aral Sea is a huge problem too. That's a primary source region. And uh, it's all primarily due to anthropogenic diversion, either for drinking water sources, but primarily agricultural purposes. And if you look at the, the history of dust on the planet, and uh, this goes back, 400,000 years ago, the blue line is temperature. So when the temperature goes up, you see the peaks, we usually have the red as dust, we have less dust. And when it gets colder and we go into ice ages, uh, more water gets tied up in the uh, as ice and you get more dust activity on the planet. So there's been, uh, this is a cyclic event throughout the history of Earth and uh, you know, when it's cold, there's more dust. When it's hot, there's typically less dust. And uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, uh, little news article that came out where they were talking about um, a, a paper in uh, Nature Communications where some scientists were hypothesizing that the iron uh, dust is, desert dust is rich in iron. And, uh, Phytoplankton can th thrive. A lot of regions of the oceans are limited in iron. So if you add iron, it's like fertilizer, uh, you get growth. And so if you can increase phytoplankton growth from ice melting and the release of iron, it may serve uh, to buffer uh, global warming. That's their hypothesis. But it's pretty sound if you look in the literature based on what we know about the iron fertilization uh, studies that have been conducted in uh, remote ocean areas. You know, I'll talk about a lot of pathogens to plant life and and uh, humans as some of the microorganisms we've identified and what type of organism they can affect. But there's also a plus to dust transport. And like the phytoplankton in the oceans that love iron and deposition and can thrive on that, like the red tide agent, 
that can cause problems, not to the algae, but to us. Um, this is the redlands, and you see this uh, red soil picture on the left. So that's the same color as the uh, dust regions of North Africa. And, uh, and the reason is, is because that has evolved over thousands of years of dust deposition in South Florida. And that's the Redlands. And the Redlands is located a little west of Miami and north of Homestead, Florida. So it's a rich, rich agricultural region and uh, plants, plants love that soil. So it's very nutrient rich and uh, there are positives. Uh, a lot of the uh, air plants in uh, South America, uh, the Amazon, uh, they derive a, a good portion of their uh, nutrient budget from uh, dust from Africa. And some of the uh, island, uh, the rainforests in uh, the northern uh, Hawaiian island chains, they derive their uh, nutrients from dust deposition that's coming out of Asia. So it's, uh, there, there's, good, there's, there's good and then there's bad with uh, global scale uh, dust diversion. And this is a picture of a core taken in the Florida Keys and you can see where um, the coral growth that occurred in this coral core and right on the line above that you don't see any coral growth but you see this tan line and that's uh, dust deposition that occurred during the uh, sea level lows during ice, ice ages so that tans that typical color like you see in the uh, the redlands of Florida and there's a record of it in the uh, in the uh, coral structures in throughout the Florida Keys and uh, the rest of the Caribbean. So, as a microbiologist, I always like to uh, give a little primer in soil microbiology since we're talking about dust storms. And uh, so, if you, you, I'm going to show you some pictures a little bit later of some microbes growing on filters. And keep in mind that uh, microbial ecology studies have shown that they only represent about 0.1 to 10% of what's really there. So, if you took an air sample and you had uh, a thousand organisms grow on the filter. That only represents 0.1 to 10% of the total microbial population. There's many microbes we don't know how to culture or they won't grow on the media types we're using and so forth. And uh, bacteria populations in, uh, in soils typically range from uh, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 uh, cells per gram. And um, the number of species is about 10,000. The dominant genera is typically bacillus. This is a spore forming uh, uh, bacteria. It does really well in atmospheric transport and dust storms because of it can form spores and spores are egg-like vesicles that can protect it during transport. Uh, and these are typical soils now, not necessarily desert soils, but the trends run true even in the deserts where there's a lot less nutrients. You'd be, You'd be surprised that I'll cover that in a second, but fungal populations typically are a million per gram and the virus populations are anywhere from a thousand to uh, 10 million per gram and the protozoans are about 10,000 uh, per gram. So most soils on the planet are, uh, are very diverse and uh, contain uh, many different types of microorganisms. Uh, this is some a sample that a colleague of mine collected in Kuwait. When he was over in the Middle East. And uh, what I did is uh, took the soil particles and stained them with cyber gold. And cyber gold is a nucleic stain. So um, the DNA or your RNA will uptake the DNA stain and it fluoresces apple green uh, when you hit it with UV light. And what you can see is many of these particles over to the right, you see many, many uh, bacteria attached to particulate matter. And same on the left, you can even, on the bottom left image, you can even see this ultra fine little particle uh, uh, light emissions. And those are typically what we call virus-like particles. So they're in the size of, uh, of viruses. And this is the paper that uh, a grad student from uh, University of La Laguna in Tenerife, in Spain, she came over to my lab, and her and a colleague you know, spent some time and working on samples. So I had her do direct counts. And direct counts are using cyber gold to count uh, bacteria and virus like particles. You usually take a sonicator to so get them off the particles. Because uh, most microorganisms, uh, they're, not, they're not free floating 
in outside of fungal spores in the environment. Most bacteria and viruses attach to particles. It's a survival mechanism. They uh, they can survive a lot longer if they're attached to a uh, par particulate of some type than if they're uh, free in the atmosphere. So anyways, if you look at these different uh, deserts that include uh, uh, death samples from like Death Valley out, out in uh, California, the Permian Basin in Texas, in uh, Arizona uh, around Flagstaff and Phoenix, and some samples that were collected in Saudi Arabia, then Morocco, Afghanistan, Kuwait, and in the uh, UAE. And the range of bacteria is about, the lowest was about 5,500 per gram. And of course, the highest were up in uh, the 10,000 range. So quite a few, and in a similar range with, uh, with viruses per gram of soil. So even though, you, yeah, you're in the middle of a desert and you can't see any plants in many of these locations. Uh, you would think that um, the soil would be pretty sterile, but they're um, pretty uh, rich microbially. Yeah, it's just a little, little bit of math here. If you take uh, an average of the annual dust that's transported around the planet, it's about 3 billion tons of dust and convert that to grams and take a conservative estimate of just 10 to the four microorganisms, just bacteria without the others included, you end up with uh, about 30 quintillion bacteria and that's enough to form a 38 cell wide bridge between Earth and Jupiter. So uh, it's a huge number of microorganisms. All right, so if you look at the history of aerobiology, um, this, is, this is a great book, The Spontaneous Generation Controversy. If you ever want to read how nasty scientists can be to each other, you know, Louis Pasteur came along and, uh, you know, studied uh, aerobiology. He was the first, really, to look at um, the transport of microbes uh, in the atmosphere. And he did this in his quest to dispel spontaneous generation, where where there was some really bad science. You know, you know, they would take a box, put some hay in it, put some food, cover it with a blanket, come back uh, a few weeks later, uncover the blanket, there would be mice in there and it'd be, ha ha, spontaneous generation. <laughs> and uh, Louis Pasteur was a true scientist and uh, developed methods to show that uh, microbes uh, moved around the atmosphere uh, in uh, uh, the built setting, in caves, on top of mountains and so forth. And this is a professor, a French professor, and uh, he, he's still, he's uh, called uh, Pasteur basically an idiot. You know, his, his theory of germs is ridiculous fiction. But it didn't turn out to be that way. And uh, a friend of his, uh, an Irish uh, scientist named uh, Tyndall, um, you know, he, he did some experiments similar to what Pasteur did with trays of nutrient, uh, different types of nutrients. And, and they would open them up and put them in an environment and then close them up and look at what grew in, in different types of growth were grown different tubes and means uh, explaining how how microbes kind of went through they weren't evenly dispersed through the atmosphere they kind of moved like clouds you know but there was enough of them to eventually cover any area uh, given enough time uh, Dale I have a question for you sure all right um, a question came in how fast did the dust storm spread across the globe I'm wondering about the likelihood of transporting of live agents that could cause disease after it blows to the next spot yeah I'm gonna I'm going to cover some of that here in a little bit um, I can tell you from the west coast of Africa when the storm rolls off till it impacts air quality in Florida it's about three to five days and when Asian dust rolls off of China um, and then starts this transport, which includes going over Japan and across the North Pacific and into North America is about five to seven days. And so most people, when I first started this research, thought that these cloud, there was enough expo UV exposure that the UV would essentially sterilize these clouds. But these clouds are so big and so thick that the upper portions of the cloud, the particle matter attenuates the UV light up to 50% up to the bottom layers. And then, of course, you can imagine if you're attached to a particle and you're tumbling, you're not continually exposed to UV. So you'll see in uh, some slides later that a uh, pretty diverse community survives um, these long trips. So uh, Darwin uh, actually published on dust in uh, 
1846, talk, talking about the count of fine dust, which often falls on vessels in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, he, uh, colleagues of his actually collected vials of dust. This is one of the vials that was given to Darwin by a colleague that collected uh, a sample right here off the Cape Verde and came around and uh, met Darwin. Um, he gave the vial to him and Darwin sent it to a, a um, they weren't called microbiologists at the time, but that's what they were, named Ehrenberg, who was at, um, in Germany. And this vial actually uh, sat there uh, since then, and this was in 1832, it was collected, and it survived World War II. And some uh, colleagues of mine I know, Anna Gorbachina and her husband, now William Broughton, um, they were actually uh, gained access to the vial, which was in the University of uh, or the Museum of Natural History in Berlin, and uh, were able to culture live bacteria and fungi uh, from these archived dust samples. That just kind of gives you a, a feel for the durability, uh, an ability to survive long periods of time with no nutrients or water or whatever in, the, in these dust samples. And microorganisms, many, uh, can go dormant over long periods of time and survive. So something that 1832 was in the early 2000s, uh, they were able to culture uh, many different types of microorganisms out of those samples. So that's pretty interesting. And Fred C. Mayer worked for the Department of Agriculture and he actually um, got the help of Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart to collect uh, airborne dust samples. And uh, he published uh, some of this work in this 1935 paper at the bottom in Science Monthly with uh, Lindbergh as a co author. Um, describing um, uh, what types of microorganisms he was able to culture from these collections. And uh, if you look at a number of his papers, he, this wasn't the only paper he published, he published quite a few. Um, the common trend was in all the papers that if there was dust in the atmosphere, um, there were higher concentrations of microorganisms. So that was back in the 30s. So, as I mentioned, Gene Shen hired me. He sent me an email when I was postdocing for John Paul at USF, this email with this image on it. And uh, he'd been talking for years. I was, like I said, he was on my PhD committee. I was fascinated with this dust hypothesis that he had. And uh, he sent me this image with a note. He goes, Dale, I got some funding from NASA. What do you think? Did you find anything? And that's all it took. Because Knowing what I know about soil microbiology, how can microorganisms in the events this big, and this is when satellite imagery was just um, becoming more prevalent that we were and we're be able to see the, the magnitude of these dust events. Um, that uh, I thought uh, this will be an easy do, you know, be easy to uh, demonstrate that uh, we should be able to find something that survives that transatlantic transport to the Caribbean in uh, uh, Florida. And this is the uh, a little, uh, anim not an animation, but a cartoon, I guess, of the North Atlanta Oscillation, which is a two-pressure system. There's a low in the north and a high in the south. And it controls, really, dust transport um, across the Atlantic. And it oscillates up, a, up and down. And this is the, uh, a record from about almost 2000 from the lake uh, starts in a more positive location in, in the late, uh, right around 1970. And what happens when it's in a more northerly location is you get less rainfall, and this corresponds in the north uh, or North Africa. And of course, you end up with more dust transport uh, across. And that's what we've uh, seen if you look you go to uh, in Mali if you look at the record since about 52 there's been a trend down in the amount of rain they've gotten to uh, um, almost the 90s and then if you look at the uh, amount of hazy days or dust haze days that they've had that's been a steep increase and if you go across the ocean to Barbados Joe Prospero University of Miami has a tower he did a lot of research before he retired I think he's still doing some stuff down there and they were looking at the North Atlantic Oscillation. So it's been trending more northerly over time from right around the 70s as the previous graph showed. And in his tower that they were collecting uh, particular dust matters have been a stepped increase in the amount of dust coming across the Atlantic. 
so I mentioned that this dust that comes into the Gulf of Mexico could be utilized by um, harm, harmful algae like the uh, Carinia brevis, which causes red tide in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's certain microorganisms that are iron lovers, uh, such as vibrios. And uh, this is some work out of Dr. Uh, Aaron Lips' lab. This Jason was one of her uh, grad students. And so they're in the Florida Keys uh, collecting water samples, doing analyses of the number of culturable vibrios that they can find in the water column. And they have a dust event hit. And then about 24 hours later, um, to 48 hours later, you get a peak in dust. It goes from uh, about 20 CFU or culture forming units per mil to over 1,000. Uh, culture forming units per mil. And these many different species of vibrios um, can cause disease. One of them is uh, Vibrio coralyticus. We know it can cause coral diseases. And uh, uh, like uh, different species can cause human disease. And every year we have a few people that get in the water and for some unknown reason, there's high concentrations of vibrios in the water column and they have a cut, they get infected and they wait too long before they go to the doctor. And uh, those outcomes are typically fatal. We don't lose a lot, but there's a number of people that die each year. And we just don't know. And we, and we think that these episodic dust events are causing these spikes that, that quickly attenuate. Um, you see, this is a dust event that has occurred on the 23rd. On the 24th, it's peaking, but then the 25th, it's already going down. So they're, take, they're scrubbing the iron out of the water column really quick and dropping back down. Uh, to those numbers that you that are typically relatively low, and uh, so that was some interesting work. Like I said again, in the Gulf of Mexico, about four million metric tons falls out, so it can certainly have an effect on human health and in, uh, in uh, oceanic health. And this is an interesting graph. This is some data again from Joe Prospero that he had graphed into the 90s. That Gene Shin actually put this together. This gene had been studying various diseases throughout. The occurrence of diseases throughout the Caribbean. You see the, the track, these uh, lightning bolts at the bottom represents El Nino years. Um, El Nino years, you actually have greater transport of dust during those years. And you see the peak event here in about 83. This was a, a period where um, we had a big die off of uh, bellcorn corals and staghorn corals, which are um, um, now on an endangered species list and diadema, which are uh, sea urchins, and they're typically like a reef lawnmower. They keep the algae from overgrowing the reefs and so forth. There was a massive die-off with them, and then shortly after that, in a few years, in 87, they had a big outbreak of uh, black band disease, and uh, they killed uh, many coral and seagrass disease. Uh, there was a huge seagrass die-off during this period, so it's interesting to see that in many of these peaks, you had these outbreaks, um, uh, various types of die-offs and, and diseases in the marine environment um, associated with these peak um, dust years. So when we first started going, we uh, were collecting samples. That, uh, we had a teacher who was at the U.S. Embassy in Bamakamali. These are 47 millimeter filters, so they're only, they're half of 47 millimeter filters. So the whole 47 millimeter filter is only about two inches across. So they're magnified here. And we had them collected in about, um, what was about 200, I think it was about 120 liters of air. And you can see the growth on them. They're just saturated with microorganisms. The, the fuzzy ones are typically fungi. The shiny ones are typically bacteria. You can see the diversity, all the different colors. And uh, so we, we had to, get on email immediately after this first sample set came in and go, you know, we need to decrease the volume to about 20, um, 20 gallons, uh, equivalent volume of a 20 gallon aquarium. So we're not talking about a lot of air. And um, a number of these, he said there wasn't a lot of dust. There were, it was dusty, but there was not a lot of dust in the air. He goes, he told me, he goes, Dale, you know, I served in Egypt before I came here. And he goes, when I say dust storm, I'm at dust storm, you know, so. Um, even with light dust storms of the Makamali, there were huge numbers of organisms. And about 10% of these, when we sequenced them, using 16S DNA sequencing, about 10% are known animal pathogens, 5% plant pathogens, and 27% are opportunistic human pathogens. And here's a few. This is a Staphylococcus species, uh, causes sepsemia in loggerhead turtles. 
um, had been identified in, in the Canary Islands, which is off off of Africa. And Bacillus pomilus is known to be able to cause bacterial blotch on peaches, and the Scordonia species can cause uh, infections in immunocompromised patients. Uh, and, sorry, Dale, we've got two questions for you. Is that all right? Sure. Okay. Um, we had, uh, are you working with anyone in Cuba looking at iron levels or bacteria in soil? No, not at the time. I, I'm not. Okay, got it. And the second question is, can you speculate on the possibility of bacteria in dust storms on Mars? Yeah, it's interesting. I was watching um, uh, the, the Mars episode on Netflix uh, the other day, and their scientists were on Mars, and, and a future projection. They were talking about what they were looking for life, and they go, well, maybe we should look for life in dust storms. <laughs> So, yeah, that's something that we believe that maybe a, a way to look for life on planets without landing on it is to look at particulate matter, fly a flyer down into the atmosphere to collect samples. Um, certainly, uh, Earth's atmosphere is loaded with uh, pathogens e or, or microorganisms, even at extreme altitudes. And that's another talk I could, you know, that's a, another whole talk, high altitude microbiology. But uh, right. that's certainly a possibility. There's one more question that just came in, and uh, do you know how many U.S. embassies are involved in these air microbe studies? Uh, that was just the one. That was it, and that lasted about three years. All right. Thank you. So, okay, so if you if we get out of Africa and you just look north, I had a colleague and contacted me in Turkey, and they're dimly, and over to the right side of the image is. Uh, or dimly Turkey, and you'll be able to see it on the image, but she had a coastal tower, uh, this tower uh, on the top left, uh, right on the coastline, and she would go up and collect samples, and this is an example of one of the filters she sent uh, with growth all over it, and it was interesting because she, she um, did some back trajectories over to the top image here, and the little dot to the right on, the, on panel A up top is where the tower was, and she's doing back trajections to determine where the air masses come from. So it clearly showed that the uh, dust was coming out of Africa. And if you look down here on the table, you see on the 14th that there's really hardly anything there. But when uh, that first edge of the, that dust event comes in, the numbers of fungi and bacteria, particularly the fungi, they were always fungal rich at that site. On the 15th goes up, uh, up to uh, 1733. And then on the 16th starts dropping back down. So that's, a great example of a pulse of dust going over a site and and uh, typically what we've seen on many of the sites is it takes about two or three days for the atmosphere to clear you get this uh, kind of like a plume tail that keeps uh, the microbial populations up for a while and uh, what we did see is that, that many of those fungi the, those samples are dominated by fungi were of the genus uh, Altenaria and this is a, a potent potent fungal allergen and uh, it's been associated with the development of asthma in exposed populations, particularly uh, children in semi-arid regions. And if you go um, out and go Sorry, ahead. Dale. We had a question that kind of relates to that. Do you find live insects in the storms at all? So, yeah, that's another story. <laughs> so, uh, one of Jean's friends was sailing on the, um, the outer side of the Caribbean with nothing between his sailboat um, uh, in Africa, but the oceans, and there was a there was an event, and it occurred in the late 80s, where a swarm of locusts got blown off by a storm, and uh, and got transported to the Americas. And, and this guy told Gene he was sailing along, and he started hearing this, dunk, zzz, dunk, zzz, and there was these big lotus hitting his sail. They were getting blown across uh, the Atlantic and sliding down the sail onto his boat. And uh, so, yeah. You know, your grasshopper, a locust, you know, as big as they are, can make it. You can imagine uh, many insects or mosquitoes and flies and so forth being pushed over. So this is, um, we're going off of, away from northern uh, Africa and to um, west towards the United States and uh, the Americas. And uh, this is the International Ocean Drilling Program. Uh, program's uh, Geordie's Resolution, and I've been on it about four different times. It's a great vessel to study mid-ocean atmospheric microbiology because they go out and they'll sit for five to six weeks at a site and then and 
this particular time in 2003, it was my first time I went home. You can see the sample site up here is right in between uh, Africa and the Americas, right in the dust corridor. You can see this is a sea wisp, and as you see the dust coming across, and this is an animation showing the kind of the concentrations of uh, dust coming across. So we were right in the zone, and uh, this is a uh, dust at 10 meters in micrograms per cubic meter, and the columns are total cultural uh, uh, bacteria and fungi. So you can see where the peaks occur. That's when we find microorganisms going over the vessel. And what was really interesting, um, well, there were a number of pathogens in these, several which were uh, previously we identified in Mali, in Bamaka Mali, with that research. And then several of the fungi, this mysterious species, Pantani, is a known uh, agent of Florida sycamore canker. And that occurs during drought years. And uh, also Altenaria dalsi, which is a known uh, pathogen of Florida carrot. So here I am out in the middle of the uh, Atlantic Ocean in the dust corridor picking up uh, plant pathogens and uh, human pathogens moving across uh, the Atlantic, some of which we had previously identified in atmospheric samples collected in Mali. And this is uh, another cruise in. I went on in 2011, and you can see I'm collecting these are about 100 millimeter filters in 24 hour collections. So you can see they're white and um, usually white. And when the dust hits, they turn that uh, Saharan dust orange. And you can see the very intense on the 14th, slacks off a little bit on the 15th, on the 16th it clears up, and on the 17th it comes back. And that's that trend of, you know, not all, it's dust isn't evenly dispersed, it comes in pulses like what Tyndall talked about it with bacteria coming in pulses you know and this is one of the samples I uh, collected on the ship and you have these beautiful tequila sunsets or sunrises even and you can see the bands of orange in the atmosphere and that's um, a dust and that's on leg uh, 336 that I collected in 2011 and um, there's so much dust you can go on top of the ship and sweep it up and bag it you know, and that's that's the hair and dust in a Ziploc that I collected on the uh, uh, roof of the bridge of the Geordie's resolution. And that similar trend, like I showed before, this is, this is one of those graphs with too much data. But what we saw was uh, the total CFU bacteria and fungi in partic uh, particular counts. I had a particle counter uh, with me at the time, which statistically uh, correlated. So when dust went up, so did microorganisms. And it makes sense. And this is just a great image um, of a dust bridge across um, the Atlantic. Like I mentioned, it takes three to five days for that to form. So that takes three to five days of continuous transmission uh, across uh, the Atlantic to form a dust bridge like that from uh, Africa to the Americas. And uh, in the Caribbean, this is what it looks like uh, when it's clear. Yeah, nice and clear and beautiful. And uh, when dust is present, kind of looks like uh, my aunt lived in San Francisco. I remember when the fog used to roll in, it kind of reminded me of that, but it significantly cuts visibility. And uh, this is a, an early sample we collected when we first started. You can see a very diverse community of fungi and bacteria growing on, on the filter. And if you graph the different types of bacteria we saw, what you saw was a very dynamic, um, very diverse microbial community. And uh, they're dominated by high GC content. High GC gram positive bacteria are typically more resistant to UV inactivation than other organisms. A lot of the yellow, uh, uh, yellow dots in this uh, graph or tree are I collected on a ship. So I was um, uh, closer to the surface water, and you typically a lot of you get sea spray inputs there. And you end up picking a lot of gram negative bacteria because they dominate in the surface water column. And uh, these are the proteobacteria. But, anyways, you can see that uh, pretty diverse uh, microbial community there. And if you go out west um, on top of Mount Bachelor to study Asian dust, this is um, Bend, Oregon, beautiful little town. I hear a lot of Californians are moving there right now. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, driving property values up, but um, they have a great ski resort at Mount Bachelor. And this is the upper ski lift. And at the top, uh, Dan Jaffe at University of Washington Bothell has an observatory under all this ice inside the building. Uh, it's a great place to do research. 
just stunning views uh, when the clouds aren't there. And these are just back trajectories showing uh, air masses originating from Asia coming to uh, Mount Bachelor and impacting it. And if you look at particle counts, the, this is separate from Asia, uh, African dust, this is Asian dust coming in, but the trend is similar. When the particle counts, which are in red, go up, the number of culturable total CFU bacteria and fungi follow a similar trend. So that just really demonstrates that these dust storms um, in varying concentrations as they move over um, carry um, different concentrations of microorganisms. It's all based on particle particle load. So this is just some of the bacteria. So very uh, diverse community. And these are some of the different fungi we've seen. Very diverse community of fungi. This is uh, some of David Smith's work. Uh, he's at NASA in DC at headquarters now. And uh, some of the uh, different fungi that he isolated using a, a, a sampler that he was working with. And again, you see often area uh, present, potent allergen. And uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Andy Sugar, who's up here in the author line, he's a plant pathologist and um, has looked at um, uh, some of the plant pathogens. And this is a graph that David sent me. This is his publication down on, on the right. And uh, what this, this is just a great illustration because this is the ring, this is the circular phylogenetic tree and the inner ring, which is mostly clear, is the microbial diversity. And, and uh, during clear days when no dust is present, and the outer band of the red, which red illustrates an increase um, in the concentrations of uh, different um, uh, microorganisms, is, is a clear illustration and a very diverse community um, coming in on, on these Asian dust. And, events are impacting Mount Bachelor. So relatively clean air on these inside rings when there's no dust present, but a very diverse microbial community um, when dust impacts uh, Mount Bachelor. And so in conclusions, um, atmospheric particulate and microbial colony forming unit concentrations are significantly correlated at a number of different research sites um, that are orient, you know, focused on African dust and transoceanic transport of African and Asian dust. And uh, both fungal and uh, bacterial diversity is high uh, in samples as determined either by culture or non-culture based protocols. In uh, recent research, we've identified virus-like particles um, in air samples. Um, Christina uh, Gonzalez and uh, Martin in uh, Tenerife has actually shown that when dust is present, she can um, you more able to detect human and terror viruses in the atmosphere than when African dust isn't present. Uh, that, that's pretty interesting. In addition to the paper that I showed you where the Taiwanese scientists identified a higher concentration of influenza viruses when Asian dust was present over their island. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, so, you know, in summary, dust storms uh, convert, you know, convey a diverse community across oceans. Uh, and this uh, mechanism of dispersion, like, play an important role in outbreaks of disease affecting a wide variety of biota in downwind aquatic and terrestrial environments. And that's my presentation and uh, be happy to take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Dale. Yeah, we've got a, a little bit of a backup in the questions, but thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Um, and if we were in person, as many of our attendees know, I'd be handing you the flag thrown, flown over the Capitol here as a token of our gratitude. So I will have to mail that to you in Florida once we oh. get access to our home base at ASM um, in downtown DC. So thank you so much for your time and sharing all this awesome information with us. Um, it's really been Good awesome time. to learn more about such a fascinating topic. And I'm, I'm, if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll start reading off some of the questions and encourage all the attendees to um, to type in your questions in the question. Um, we've got 10 minutes, so we'll try to get through um, as many as we can. Okay. All right, uh, so I have, um, is there an extensive air quality surveillance effort at US embassies? No, there isn't. Okay. No, not, not like we had um, in Bamakamali. I mean, I'm sure we could set something like that up if there was interest, um, but right now there, there's not. And that would be that would be a great thing to have, you know. One of the problems with understanding dispersion of microorganisms in the atmosphere on a global scale 
is um, limited research sites. We had an active monitoring program or just occasional samples were collected at our embassies. That would be that would be huge. Got it. Thanks, Neil. Okay. Uh, so one of our attendees is working on airborne dust microbiome over the Red Sea and has noticed the presence of oscillatoria in their airborne 16S um, RNA data in addition to a coral black band disease outbreak in the Red Sea. Uh, so do you think there would be a correlation between those findings? And let me well, know if, if I can read know. If you know that that is the organism, like, you know, it would be helpful to be able to collect the same organism from the surface of the coral um, to make to establish that link. So, and I'm not sure, has the black, I'm asking a question now, has the black band disease agent been positively identified? I don't recall. I know that a lot of coral diseases has been a huge problem in identifying the causative agent. You know, a lot of times it's attributed to multiple organisms and so forth. But that's an interest with us, looking at dust storms and uh, how that affects the microbial community on the surfaces of corals. Um, that's something that uh, we may start up in the dry tortugas uh, pretty soon. Um, but we haven't got that going yet. So it certainly sounds like an interesting project, you know, and I know there's a lot of interest in that type of research. Gotcha. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, next question is, do you know if of any dust collection stations other than Aeronet in Iraq, Iran, or Syria, preferably for 2017? For 2017, like an archive, I guess it would be an archive, right? Yeah, that's my best understanding of the question, and um, feel free to reach out um, in the question I mean, box. I, I have I have an archive of samples that go back over time. I'm not sure that there are many archives that exist. Specifically for microbiology, like a lot of the Aeronet sites and stuff like that, they weren't designed for microbiology studies. So there's issues of contamination with handling of the filters and and uh, you know setup and so forth. You know a lot of those the the networks were designed for chemical analyses where contamination is a huge problem. So uh, it would be nice if we had something like that. Yeah, actually, NASA just funded. Um, some colleagues of mine at Virginia Tech and uh, and um, um, Christina at in Tenerife at La Laguna and myself to look at to model um, diversity and changes in diversity based on some archive samples that we have that we have some match dates and so forth. But it, it, you know if you look in the literature, there's not a whole lot of publications on this just because there's not a whole lot of scientists studying it. You know, I know the military has done a lot. Um, because of um, troop health issues and, and so forth, but I, I'm not sure if they've archived samples or not. Thanks, Dale. Okay, yeah. next question is, do organisms have to be ad adapted for this transport or the conditions there are quite hospitable and most microorganisms might benefit from such trips? How selective are the storms? Yeah, I. I think you know these storms might be a mechanism to maintain diversity in regions or enhance diversity in regions. Um, I think um, given changes in humidity and temperature, you know where you are in the cloud, are you up high, are you down low, um, you know, or where, where the available nutrients to help you survive a trip are all factors that affect diversity. Where you know you may have a given event where. Uh, organism that you typically wouldn't expect to survive long range trip like a gram negative bacteria um, uh, that could survive it. You know, there's a lot we still don't know. You know, this is uh, most of the research on dust storms has occurred over the last 20 years, and there hasn't been a whole lot compared to other fields of microbiology. 
There's lots we still don't know. That's a good point, Theo. Okay, our next question is, with increases in antimicrobial resistance, has there been any assessment of whether the microbes dispersed contain resistance, endogenetic elements, endos, insodyne genetic elements? Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> no, that's a really, really in interesting topic, something that I uh, started research on. Actually, Christina on some uh, early Molly um, isolates. I uh, used a little antibiotic disc to, to look at um, uh, antibiotic resistance and many of the species were um, resistant not only to one um, antibiotic but to multiple antibiotics so I, I'm sure that varies with region There's something else that's really really interesting is um, the ability to viruses and viruses drive evolution so they typically move um, toxin genes and genes like antibiotic resistance genes and other virulence genes uh, between um, those organisms that have it and those that don't. So the bacteria themselves, uh, we know from some uh, work we just published a couple of years ago, can carry uh, FODs that are integrated in their DNA. And the way you can check that is you can isolate the bacteria and you can expose them to a mutagen like mitomycin C, and that causes FODs that are integrated in their DNA, DNA to excise, start replicating, and, uh, and lice the cell. And uh, so that's antibiotic resistance. That's a hot topic. It's recently been, uh, you know, not too long ago was a deed as emerging contaminant, huge issue with human health. And, uh, you know, one of the, uh, again, one of the, the limits of our understanding of antibiotic resistant genes is the lack of background data. There's not a lot of studies that look at, looked at the prevalence natural prevalence of these genes uh, in various environments. It's something we've started just doing, uh, but it's, it's, it's needed work. And it's a great hot topic right now. Thank you. All right. Um, how long did you culture the microbes to see the large colorful clusters of bacteria and fungi? Okay, so that's those most of the, all the images were grown on R2A, which is a low nutrient auger. Um, and I typically give them about five days to grow like that. It takes them a while because the nutrient level is very low. And the reason we use a low nutrient is if you take a stressed microorganism, one that's maybe almost at the stage of uh, viable but non cultural because of oxidative stress or UV stress or, or some other type of stress. Um, what a low nutrient, what a, a rich nutrient auger like blood auger or TSA, triptych soy auger, or some other rich nutrient auger, if you put a stressed cell on it, they'll take the nutrients up and they'll end up dying. It's kind of like racing a horse, running a horse, and then letting them drink a lot of water. It's <coughs> very similar. So if you take a low nutrient auger uh, like R2A or 10% TSA, something like that and you stick it on there, it allows those cells that are injured to recover and adjust and grow. But it, it takes a longer period of time than your typical culture period, which is 24 to 48 hours in the field of microbiology, like public health microbiology. So we always go, um, a friend of mine, he, he, he goes seven to 10 days. On, he does a lot of subsurface microbiology work. So he'll go out longer. I did some high altitude stratospheric microbiology work and had some samples come in from nasa i plated them nothing grew in two weeks i was like oh well that was pretty depressing after all that work to get uh samples from 60,000 feet but i i couldn't bring myself to throw away the plates so i wrapped them in parafilm and set them on top of the counter and then like four at four weeks i walk back in the lab and i just look over at the plates and there's growth on them i couldn't believe it you know so that was like four weeks ago you know, so, um, you know, traditional um, incubation periods, you know, you definitely want to stay away from when you're uh, studying like high altitude or atmospheric microbiology. You definitely need to extend out your incubation periods. The longer, the better. You know, give you greater recoveries. But you got to watch out if you get some fungi in there that are fast growers, you know, you, they can overgrow everything relatively quick. So there's ways to take care of that, but then you lose your fungal diversity analyses and stuff like that. But that's almost the top of myself. Thanks, Dale. All right, we had a, um, 
we've still got a few bit of questions and short on time. So I'll kind of tie a bow on some of the virus questions and um, then remind our audience that uh, uh, Dr. Griffin has been kind enough to be responsive to questions that we can provide, provide that we haven't gotten to um, following the talk. So um, the virus questions are, are the viruses effective or, or, or are they just finding DNA, RNA, um, but our attendees said I'm no virologist. Uh, how are the viruses surviving without a host? Are you finding bacteriophage? Um, yeah, all the all the work that I know, like the Taiwanese, that was all PCR based. So, and they didn't use cell culture in their assessment. So, it it could be just a genome. And Christina's work in Tenerife and the Canary Islands. That was all PCR based, so there was no cell culture used on that. So you can't address viability uh, uh, without cell culture. I mean, you could use an RT reaction and make the argument that R the RNA, and I've seen it done with other pathogens like protozoan pathogens, that if you get an RNA-based signal that um, it's assumed to be alive. I, I don't, I, I don't believe that. I don't think that's the case when it comes to viruses. So, and then plaque assays with FODGE, I don't know anybody that's done that on long range atmospheric samples and gotten plaques. So you can get, you can visualize that people have done microscopy like I have where you can see them, um, but viability hasn't been addressed yet. So that's kind of wide open too in the world of virology and dust storms. All right. All right, we're close on time. So I'm just going to wrap up tonight and say thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much again, Dr. Griffin, for joining us and sharing such an awesome presentation. Um, have gotten some really great feedback on the questions. Um, and thanks for the insight and gratitude, as well as um, being reminded that uh, today is the first day of World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. So awesome. a bit for folks, <laughs> timing is good. Thanks for that reminder. Um, and yeah, just gonna throw some announcements outside um, our talk tonight that uh, since everything is pretty remote friendly, just uh, you can find in our email reminders, some resources available. The Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History has a AIDS at the intersection of community science and policy webinar series going on in December. So feel free to reach out or just pull up the email notifications um, with those links. And then just FYI, in terms of One Health, the United Nations has uh, adopted a resolution that includes One Health in September. So that information is also included in the email. So reach out if you're not getting those. Um, really just want to say thanks again, Dr. Griffin, for all his time and information. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys next month and hope everyone has a safe um, and healthy Thanksgiving. Yeah, and anyone that has any more questions, uh, please email me. It's dgriffin at usgs.gov. I'd be happy to talk to you anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Griffin. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you guys next month. Hope everyone stays safe. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, guys.